Hello everyone and welcome to this week's episode of the Live On Purpose show and I'm really excited to share this episode with you because I have the amazing and wonderful Stella Camber joining me as my guest. Stella is the founder of More Life Adventures which is a retreat experience company that enables people to get back to feeling fully themselves, to feel their best, to immerse themselves in fitness and to connect with like-minded people and go on adventures. And Stella created this um, based on her own life experiences, which she shares all about during the episode. And Stella and I connected um, about a year ago, maybe two years ago even, uh, when she reached out after I had put something out that I'd created. And I'm so glad that she did. Um, because I now get to share her wonderful story with you and her amazing wisdom with you. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Um, sit back, relax, get yourself a cuppa and uh, let's dive right in. Welcome everybody to this episode of the Live On Purpose show and I'm really really excited and delighted today to have the wonderful Stella Camber joining me to talk about her journey through burnout and changing her life um, basically um, so welcome Stella thank you so nice to have to be here and to be on your podcast yeah thank um, you so much for agreeing to come and be a guest um, so for obviously I've done a brief introduction before this but ha, let's start with you introducing yourself and telling people who, who you are in short sure um who I am with uh, with that in general without talking about what I do or what I do both well, yeah. yeah I guess I guess um I guess I've I've done a lot of different things but I um I now run fitness retreats and uh they we can talk about it later but they've it's uh, it comes as a combination of different things that I've done in the past and lessons that I learned and um, burnouts that I've had that I uh, made me realize what humans need in order to survive and thrive um, and I sort of put a survival kit or maybe not survival kit like thriving kit together and this is what I try and offer the world at the moment um, which I'm very I don't like the word passionate because it implies lack of logic, but I'm very excited about it. Um, <laughs> um, I'm very excited to offer, offer the world my uh, thriving kit. Um, so yeah, um, and it's been, it's been a, um, a journey of experiences, I guess, that has been. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the case with many of us. It's our own lived experiences that have brought us to, to doing what we do. Um, and I really love how you describe it as a thriving kit, because I think so many of us are, are really stuck in survival mode. And that's not really the pleasant, the most pleasant place to live our lives from. Mm. Um, and yeah, I think it's really, really important that we all start to think about, um, you know, not how much can I bear, but how good can this get? Mm. Um, which is what thriving is all about. So that mm. sounds, um, yeah, sounds amazing. Um, so well, let's start with talking a little bit about then the experiences that led you to do what you're now doing. Mm. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> where, where would you start with, with that? Um, I grew up in a workaholic family and I don't think it was just my family. It was the whole culture of um, productivity or contribution is a virtue which is not entirely wrong mm. um but more you know defining yourself by what you do what you contribute uh and you know the you know hard work being the um top virtue and um just generally a little bit of um sidelining who you are in favor of what you do and so that's one thing. Um, and so I don't think I was ever encouraged to express who I was, what I wanted, my dreams, all that stuff. They were sort of very much um, lying low. And I, didn't, I wasn't even aware of them. I think 
in my first 18 years of my life, I didn't know emotions. I wasn't, I mean, this will probably sound shocking to most people, but it's, it's the truth that I was completely unaware of what emotions, how emotions should be expressed, what a healthy expression of emotion would be. And so I was a very frustrated kid, very lonely kid, not outwardly lonely, you know, I was surrounded by people, but inwardly incredibly lonely. And uh, just didn't have a healthy way to connect at all. And then when I came to, and then I had enough sort of sense to realize that this was not sustainable. So I was um, sort of decided that I would leave home um, as soon as I could. I think I tried to leave home, I, you know, I tried to say, uh, can you put me in boarding school? Because I, I knew it wasn't, things weren't working. So I left home and then at, at the age of 18, you know, I was sort of a pressure cooker of emotion and I didn't quite know how that was going to come out. Mm. And it came out in all sorts of unhealthy ways. I mean, thankfully I'm still alive, but, and didn't get into drugs, but I have very erratic eating. I... I just there was a bundle of stress really and uh not sure what, that this is going in the right direction but you might want to <laughs> repeat the question <laughs> yeah no no I think it is it's like it, this is the thing it's it's not just you know having an experience of being stressed out in work in corporate that that leads us to to make a change it's almost like a whole like it's a lifetime of, of lessons and things like I can also relate that I shut down my emotions um when mm. I was quite young and because I didn't feel safe to express them. Right. And like, it's like, right. I'm only now at age 40. Am I really starting to learn how, how to express them and really recognizing actually this could be one of the keys to me living a much more fulfilling life is if I can unlock this. So, you know, I think that like you were saying, not being able to feel emotions and being a bit of a pressure cooker, it leads you into things that aren't necessarily like work even and ways of working that aren't necessarily good for you and for your nervous system yeah in particular yeah. i think a lot of the time the world at, at least at that time the world celebrated that the world mm. celebrated um putting our real self and putting you know our weaker vulnerable selves to the side and being a a sort of a, in, in a steel armor and it was only fairly in the past 10 years when you know the Brené Brown books have come out mm -hmm. and people are so suddenly celebrating vulnerability there was no such thing when I was growing up there was I'd never yeah. heard of the word um yeah. I think I first heard of it in 2013 <laughs> to put a date to it because I remember reading yeah it. I think I was about the same time for me and I it was around about the same time I think that I discovered meditation previous to that I was like who has time to meditate? I have things to do. Like, I really was, you know, in that vein. And it, things really, I think it is around that time things really started to change. Yeah. Yeah, but um, I think for, for, to take, you know, because it's never good to sort of put the blame on anything other than yourself, because mm -hmm. then it means you don't have control. I think to to us to take some of the to take full responsibility of it. I think that things came to a halt in when I was twenty seven, which apparently is a very 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 um, common age for like, yeah for people to have a crisis. It's like Saturn return or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's um I've heard worse. I've heard that there are you know suicidal um, tendencies around that age, yeah. and I had some. I had, I didn't necessarily, I wasn't necessarily planning my death, but I was, I did call the Samaritans with being sort of completely like, what is life about? Like, I don't mm. see the point of this. Like, I don't see, I think I'm an accident. I don't think any of this was worthwhile. Like, help me out. <laughs> and I think at that point I, I started doing, um, I started going to a church just, and they said to me, listen, you were not an accident. You were planned. Like every one of us is, planned there is a purpose to your life and that helped me even though I wasn't really um can't say I was convinced of much but I thought well this is going to help me survive tomorrow you know and 
uh, they sort of started putting some value back into my into me when I didn't give myself any value. I didn't have any self worth. I didn't think that I had anything to offer. And they said, "No, you do. You just need to believe, <laughs> believe that you do, and then let's start from there." So they offered me some counselling, and I remember the first thing the counsellor made me do was write a hundred good things about your situation. And I was like, I got to four or five and I was like, I'm stuck. <laughs> um, she was like, come on, come on. You, you've got to be able to find a hundred. I was like, seriously, no. Um, <laughs> I was like, can we reduce it to 20? Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, through definite, you know, I, as you said, you know, I, I made a career move that was I think at age 16, I wanted to study anthropology and uh, was definitely, there was definitely something in me that wanted to study humans, you know, how humans behave, what makes them who they are. There was definitely a lot of that search in me because also I was sent to a lot of summer camps with a lot of different people from a lot of different places and I found them fascinating. Um, but anyway, didn't know what I was going to do with an anthropology degree. So I went the safe route of my whole family is a, has a construction background. So I was, I did architecture, which was fine for a while. But then the minute I started working, I put all of my dreams and passions and things aside. And I was mm. like, I'm now in work mode. I'm going to do what's expected of me, which is this work. And I just completely forgot about everything that makes me who I am. And that lasted, I sort of went within along those lines for a few years and started burning out left right and center and then I started finding things to do that would sort of restore humanity like learn a language and volunteer and do some fitness uh, I remember I did this course called habits of the heart and it was you'd work on a habit for two months and one of them was the one I did the worst in was nature so I had no contact with nature I was never in the country and the uh, my mentor said to me, you'll have 15 minutes every day to go and stare at trees. So I would go and look at trees, <laughs> just look at them. And so I'd go to the park, literally spend 15 minutes looking at the trees and then come back home. Cause like you said, I was like, well, where's the productivity in that? You know, I've got things mm -hmm. to do. I can't just sit and look at trees. Yeah. And it just yeah. struck me as the most hilarious, ridiculous thing, but that I had to do at the time. But I could also see the point in it in that after 15 minutes, I'd be like, you're good. You're good about life. I've just seen something beautiful. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Stuff like that, you know, it took a lot of, um, eventually, um, I had a friend in architecture, in my architecture job. I had a few friends who we were all sort of, when things were wrong, we would all support each other. And so him and I were trying to get onto the same project because we really wanted it. And we both got it. And then we both realized it wasn't really what we wanted. You know, it, that sort of sense that, you know, is it worth it? Like, does mm. the world, what, where's the why in this? Like, why are we building this building? And it was just to make this guy money. Does the world need this building? You know, if you don't, humans are clever, you know, if they don't see a really strong why, they totally detach or they, you know, yes, I wanted the money for sure. But I was also at the point of like, I don't want the money enough, you know? Um, and so we both quit around the same time. And I felt that because I'd studied architecture for so long and I'd worked in it for so long and it was paying good money, I felt like I really needed a strong reason to leave. Um, and I remember asking my, one of the directors who was sort of the, the guy that I felt closest to, I was like, I'm thinking of leaving, is this a good move? And he said, you're young, you have no kids, you have no mortgage, do the things, you know, go and explore. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I sort of felt that I needed his permission or somebody's permission. So I did. And then I sort of didn't know what I was going to do because when you're immersed in something, you have no time to think about. Yeah. Anything. So yeah. I took some time out. I thought I'm going to do some related studies and then I'm going to get another job in architecture that's a bit more aligned to my goals, you know, maybe environmentally friendly, maybe more socially responsible, something like that. Knowing deep down inside, still wasn't really going to be my thing but I sort of justified it in my head yeah. so I did go and do some courses and 
in the meantime volunteered a lot at the local church and then volunteered so much they finally said to me do you want to ask do you want to get paid for the work that you do because you're here every day and <laughs> we have some jobs going um so I randomly accept that the reason you know I was just so into it is because architecture had left me completely dry you know there was no social contribution you know I wasn't making anybody happier it wasn't like we were building people homes or pe building individual homes we were literally doing office buildings hotel but which you know there, of course there is a reason for them but personally was I making anybody happier no so and I think there is a coach in me that was just felt completely you know unfulfilled and that church job you know I knew the names of the homeless people in the in the area I knew them by name I was I was responsible for I don't know volunteering and leading other volunteers I can't quite remember but it was just so rewarding to suddenly be surrounded by people that I was personally in touch with and personally motivating them to also volunteer mm. and they eventually got this job where I was running a little a small business for them and it was a bookshop and a cafe and it had again we had a lot of volunteers help us run it and um just the I mean it was a completely different environment first of all it was not a boys club which makes a difference because there was a bit more variety yeah um and then there was free counseling so they had this counselor or therapist I don't know what the right word is but she called me one day and she said let's meet and I was like Let, what is the you know what are we meeting about and she sort of asked questions and so she her role was to make sure that people were balanced and they were not going to burn out and I thought mm. this is so opposite of what I've done so far yeah. it's almost annoying like so to that point I thought I mean, it was so skewed. To that, up to that point, I thought, my boss, all my boss wants me is to work as hard as possible. And, you know, the harder I work, the better, basically. And this yeah. woman was telling me to go home and sleep and be balanced. And I was like, who, yeah. who don't get this? You know? Parallel universe. Yeah. I mean, I was so deflated. Every time I, I met her, I was like, I don't get what I'm supposed to do here. <laughs> my role is bizarre. And she said, listen, Charities are known for burning people out. And my role is to protect you and this organization from you leaving, you burning out and leaving. And I thought, okay, I get the logic in this and mm -hmm. I'm going to go along with this. And so by making, um, you know, setting a different standard, I then was given room to, you know, be myself and... Uh, it was just such a healthy environment or a much healthier environment even yeah. though I wasn't at a healthy place it was just a way way more human environment where people were free and I could tell that people mm. were being themselves whereas before everybody well not everybody but I was wearing a mask and yeah so I was in an environment where nobody was wearing a mask and I was like still you know with the mask of like I am, <laughs> I am doing my job robot yeah yeah completely yeah. and you know it takes some role models for you yeah. to shed the mask doesn't it and yeah yeah definitely and I think when you've also when you've been in that corporate environment which is often a very masculine environment as well I remember one of the the bosses where I where I was working previously coming over to one of my colleagues and saying we don't bring our emotions to work and I was like holy fuck that's what's wrong with like this entire thing because we're we are emotional wow. beings you know how do we not bring our emotions to work um wow. and yeah the culture as when I made my transition to doing something else that people were like oh you can do corporate well-being and, da, da, da. and I was like yeah but the only programs I've seen are about okay how do we like get these people into a state where they can be more productive you know it was the well-being that they were providing wasn't about you being yourself and you know being balanced it was more about how you could enhance their productivity so I was never particularly interested in that side of things because of that um and yeah so when you when you come out and you 
you I certainly found as well and it sounds like you did that I could no longer put the entire blame on the organization that I was in because when I came out and I started creating the same conditions for myself as in must work hard must work hard I'm not working hard enough I, oh okay <laughs> so it's actually in my head where, where wherever it was conditioned from like you said earlier it's mine now and I need to find a way of of undoing that and finding a different way of being and doing yeah yeah I completely relate I completely relate yeah it's sort of about it's all about being liked isn't it when at some point in life we realize that to be in order to be accepted we yeah. have to perform and or maybe you know those around us in positions of power are performing and they are being very sort of performance oriented yeah. um yeah but you know we've both come to the same conclusion and I think you sent me some questions and the, the one of the questions was you know what makes you um live on purpose and mm. I think for me it's bringing what you said bringing your whole self to things um yeah and it doesn't have to be I think what people I'd, I'm trying to put myself in the head of your of that boss that you mentioned mm. who clearly must have had a bad experience of someone bringing you know drama to work which I also understand you know it, yeah. if you bring all your drama to work then it's also unproductive because we all have drama um but it's how we make the expression of emotion safe mm. to discuss safe enough to discuss you know like I I'm feeling really low or I'm on my period for example and I'm not as productive as I usually am yeah. but I'm still here and I'm still going to do my best I mean can yeah. I just tell you in my 10 years eight to 10 years of being in an architecture job I never once said I have period pain and I had once a month I had a day when I was like literally doing nothing mm. and I couldn't I, my brain was somewhere else Yeah, I still um, get that now. And, you know, I still do a bit of corporate consulting, but, you know, never, I think I've got one colleague to whom I'll say, oh, it's the time of the month, like, I'm not productive. Yeah. But I would, yeah, I still would not say that to, to my other colleagues because I know that the response would be, we just need to get on with it. Like, take some ibuprofen or something. <laughs> like, you know, I don't like, no, I don't take ibuprofen. I try, you know, as, yeah ironic that I'm working for a big pharma company but um you know I it's still it's unspoken and yeah there is that again we were, we were discussing this a bit earlier like it's a patriarchal system that requires women to work like and be the same every single day and we're absolutely not um, yeah. yeah yeah but I think that's our responsibility to share because at the same time you can't expect mm. men to get the, to get this when we're all hiding it like who are they going to hear it from uh, other than yeah. us yeah it's so true. I, yeah. I again I sort of what's the word I um, regret you know that there were a few times when it was the first day of my period and that my periods were because I was so stressed and under mm. out of balance I had massive cramps like I was I don't get this these days. Like I do yeah. have cramps, but it, I can still function. Back then it was almost like you'd put a sack of stones on my tummy in the morning and I couldn't get up. And, and even mm -hmm. when I sat down trying to do my work, it was almost like someone had anesthetized me and I wasn't really there. And so I had migraines, blah, blah, blah. And so I would call in, you know, a few times that I was like, there's no way I'm going to work. I called in the morning and I said I had a massive migraine which is a massive cop-out because I didn't have a migraine. I had a massive period issue that I knew no one was going to understand. And they will probably think that I had something else that I was disguising with the period issue. And that, you know, that's how my brain used to work. And mm -hmm. of course I can't blame the you know, majority male environment for not understanding because they wouldn't, you know, they, none of them would suffer from those things. So they, it would be very odd for them to, to really get it. They would probably say, ah, you know, let's give her a day off. She deserves it. You know what I mean? Yeah. They would yeah. never think she truly cannot function today. Yeah. Um, but we are perpetuate the, this kind of behavior mm -hmm. from us perpetuates the problem. Yeah. You know, we, well, I used to hide my stuff, you know, my, I'd go to the, to the toilet and hide everything. Yeah. But, 
yeah I mean I, that's I don't know that I would you know tucking them up your sleeve yeah. um and I remember oh, the, I, the last place that I worked they actually oh. had them in the toilet um cubicles in the ladies toilets and I was like oh my god this is amazing like I no longer have to like tuck them up my sleeve and hide and on the way to the toilet yeah. and they're being provided as like a, a necessity for women it was yeah. you know, it's not like men haven't seen them before. <laughs> I know. I know. And it's, yeah, it, you're, you're totally right. It's like there is a certain level of um, onus, responsibility on, on us to, to be honest about these things. Um, mm -hmm. Because until we actually do, I think it's going to change. Um, because people just, people will just think that it's, you know, it's, it's a non-issue. Yeah. Know? Actually, can yeah. I tell you though something uplifting I once um I think we're fast forwarding to a lot later in life when I was in a CrossFit gym and it was a class and it was a quite a tough workout I remember and I said to the coach um I'm on my period and if I'm not I can't even remember offering it as an excuse but I said oh by the way I'm on my period and he immediately said right you need to reduce the weights or, or he said something along the lines of don't go too heavy, don't mm. go too much pressure, blah, blah, blah. And I think I probably said something like, oh, no, we're fine. And then he messaged me and sent me a link to a video um, about um, strength and the strength, the, the strength and the menstrual, the menstrual cycle mm. and how it might affect you. And I remember thinking, I love this guy. You know, if he was able to educate me on my, you know, on how I should be performing according to my cycle, then, you know, yeah. long may this continue. May he educate yeah. you know, the rest of us. Yeah. And I realized there are men out there that are fully on board and are fully able to empathize. And not only that, but coach women accordingly. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, this sort of, light bulb moment and also a mm. massive breath of fresh air for me yeah yeah I think um there's certainly a nutritionist that I work with who's like the first three days like no no working out like you just don't do it which I don't always keep to that rule I have to say um but also slightly different but still related I was having in a singing lesson once and my voice was cracking and it was not as clear as usual and my singing teacher who was a woman she just said to me where are you in your cycle are you I think it shows are you premenstrual and I was like yeah she, oh okay that's why oh. I was like oh my god it has an impact on the wow. vocal cords as well oh my goodness it was just like yeah still so much to learn about the oh, impact that yeah. it does have on the body um, yeah yeah well, yeah. I think, I don't know, you know, I, I haven't read a ton, but I try and follow Christiana Northrup and mm -hmm. her, her daughter, Kate Northrup. And um, I think her daughter is, is big on um, everything being cyclical and yeah. everything running yeah. on a cycle. And I love that. Um, I don't know why I said this. <laughs> Never mind, it'll come back to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I think it's, I don't, I know a lot of other people and I have other friends who work very much with cycles and, and, you know, this part of your cycle is good for this and this part of your cycle is good for that and this part of your cycle. And, but then I think there's also an element of getting, of learning about your own. So, you know, I, a lot of people, people will say, well, premenstrual, you know, you're not going to be very productive at sometimes like when I'm premenstrual, I'm like, no more messing around like I'm gonna get this done <laughs> so actually right. it can be quite a productive time for yeah. me yeah yeah yeah. Um, yeah so yeah it's fascinating um yeah. let's and I think sorry yeah I was, I was just gonna say let's talk about how you came to be running more life adventures um but if there's something else you wanted to add um no I just to finish off the previous one mm -hmm. I the week after it's important to know yourself, as you said, because then you can give your best. Yeah. And when you own, it, it is a back to self-worth, you know, when you own mm. and that you, your contribution is valuable, then it's okay if one day it's below and the other day it's above, you know, because overall this mm. whole thing makes you you. And for the, I remember at uni sort of 
comparing a lot and being, oh, I must be producing this much every day, blah, blah, blah. But no, everyone produces differently under different circumstances. Everyone needs different, um, a different environment. And uh, I remember a lot of us were doing all night as well as we had someone who was like nine to five every day, nine to five, he would produce stuff. So, um, yeah. It's yeah. good to be, give yourself that permission to be like, what's my natural cycle? Like? Yeah. Yeah. And I think so many of us push, we're going, yeah, like you say, we compare and we try and be the same. And certainly, kind of working from home and working for myself as well, I've really learned like, I've probably got four, maximum five hours of work in me a day. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not getting anything valuable out of me outside of that time. Right. I need loads of time to play which for me is like move my body go for a walk um Mm -hmm. and yeah you want me to work in the evening like not a chance Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know not not anything that requires you know immense concentration Mm -hmm. um yeah and I'm I'm a a late afternoon person as well which is not always convenient when you're working in corporate everyone is logging Mm -hmm. off and I'm just waking up but Mm -hmm. um you know, at least I, I know now, okay, if I want to do something productive, uh, I'll do this focused work at this time. And then I'll do my admin clearing the decks kind of stuff in the morning. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you're doing high level work and does it really matter when you do it as long as it's high level? Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. I'm going to put my glasses back on yeah. because I can see you better. <laughs> So yeah. how did you come to, I'm guessing you, you trained as a, as a personal trainer. Um, and then how did it evolve the, the more life adventures piece? How did yeah. you, I guess, how did you get started? And also what kind of like, challenges, imposter syndrome did you have to deal with in actually setting mm. it up? Mm. Um, so I left architecture and got this job for this church slash charity running this, what could be called a startup. Mm-hmm. And I very much embraced it as my own, even though it wasn't my own, it was the organizations, but because they didn't really have a business arm, I was the business arm. So I was like, this is, and it wasn't really, it didn't have a form. We could, I could form it into something. And I embraced that. There was something in me that, you know, the business owner had just woken up. <laughs> And I was like, wow, we have a startup. And I did the business plan. And I was like, I was telling them this and that and the other. And they probably thought it was crazy because I was investing so much time in it. And they were like, listen, it's just a little project we have. <laughs> you really, this is not <laughs> Apple. <laughs> and you are not Steve Jobs. And um, <laughs> it was hilarious. I mean, I was, they must have thought I was nuts. Um, but they were fully on board with me being nuts. <laughs> but um, it sort of woke up, yeah, an interest in, in business that I've, I've prob- I had for a long time, but I had sort of pushed down to be an employee. And then I realized I'm better at being a startup person than an employee. But anyway, that came along in the... So um, eventually this ran its course and I realized this was not going to be... There was no growth to it. They wanted to get it to... a workable um level and then they wanted to keep it at that level so i sort of i was like okay that's great i've helped you develop this and now i don't have an interest in running it for the next 10 years so i should probably find what i'm going to do for the next 10 years and in the meantime they'd help me sort of get back to my dreams and i got a lot into fitness and i did a lot of volunteering in fitness i I was leading runs and i was leading various projects so I got my towards the end of that I got my PT certificate started working as a PT Um, and bit by bit I sort of got more and more hours and then I was at this Virgin Active on uh, near Bank at Mansion House so uh, all my clients were working near Bank and they were all in some sort of corporate environment I had very few had one student and one someone one person who wasn't a lawyer or or a Mm -hmm. or in a bank um and their their day was you know get up early go to the gym 
go to work, leave work, have dinner and sleep. And my day was the same. And it was most of the year, you know, in a gray, in, in gray weather. The gym was in the basement, so there was very little natural light. Mm-hmm. and that whole you know day after day after day of that same rinse and repeat was it wasn't emotionally emotional burnout it was just physical burnout I think you know the the fact that you need to see the sunlight and you yeah. need to move for more than an hour where you know we're encouraged to think that it's okay to sit down on your computer and drink coffee and then you know for the majority of the day and then go to the gym and absolutely you yeah, know, smash out something really intense and that's you know it's not feasible it's where it's how injuries happen because we don't really get enough movement in the day and mm. so the body isn't really is, gets very tight and then sort of is asked to do a ton of things very quickly so I felt that <laughs> ironically though I was a personal trainer I was really enjoying it and I was loving the one-on-one relationship where I could actually make a difference And it wasn't just a physical difference. It was, you know, people trust you with their information and their goals and their dreams and their personal situations. And I felt that really rewarding. But physically, I felt that there is an irony in this, in that this is not health. And me working in a basement all day is not health. And so there came a point where I was like, I've got to fix this irony. And I went on this fitness holiday and... Because it was my jam, really. It was a fitness holiday that my the head coach at my gym was organizing. And I'd seen it around on Instagram. And then I saw a few more pictures and I thought, this is so my jam. Why have I not been to this? So I went and then halfway through the trip, I, I thought to myself, I want to run this too. Um, and I think it was a combination of me doing fitness, you know, volunteering in fitness jobs, um, and having a place in Crete where I've been taking friends for a long time and having been to a lot of summer camps and done a lot of like group activities with other kids and just knowing that this is like the dream holiday. Um, and so I really, really enjoyed it. I told the, the head coach who was running it, I said to him, listen, if you want a second location, I have a place in Crete where you can come and do this. And at the back of my mind, and during the holiday, you know, people were talking about their home setup, and I thought, I'm going to do this in Crete and see what happens. And on the last day of that holiday, my dad died, and that was like such a an interesting timing because it really brought home that life is short, and mm-hmm. if you're going to do something, don't delay it. Like if you really want to yeah. do something, just do it. Yeah. What are you waiting for? And it also um, gave me some urgency that, you know, my dad had been the business guy and now he was no more and someone needed to take that on somehow. Like I had this bug basically that he passed on. So it didn't take long because I we had that home in Crete and um, it's, it's a small thing. You know, we there was a yard and we put in a concrete slab and a rig and bought some weights and changed the houses a little bit and it was there like physically there was not a ton of development work to do but um it still took some time and i got some help from my mom um and that head coach came to see it and he gave me his help and i got a lot of help from a lot of people but it was to answer your question how did it happen it happened from a combination of me wanting an outlet to the sort of basement mm-hmm. living yeah. and knowing that I thought that I would, was going to take my clients there, that this is, would be the, a service that I was providing as um, aside from the PT work. And actually, in fact, not a lot of clients took me up on it. Some did, but um, most of them, you know, had plans or were getting married or having kids or, you know, different things. Um, but anyway, it took a good few months of me being there to organize it so I had to eventually give up my clients and give them to other PTs Um, and eventually we ran a few um, trips in the summer of 2019 and they all went well and I thought okay there's something here like people are loving it Uh, when I went back um, 
I started doing PTing again on a part-time basis and then it didn't really work out because you can't really do PTing part-time mm -hmm. and you can't really do events part-time either. So it, it sort of eventually I had to make a decision. But if to answer your question, I don't think I had much of an imposter syndrome in this. Mm. I did definitely have imposter syndrome in the uh, PT um, uh, work in the beginning anyway, because I never had an athletic background. You know, when you see personal trainers that have yeah. always had a sport, that did sports and exercise science at uni, and I had not done none of that. And I thought, what qualifies me to be here with these guys? Um, and so I put in, I put in some serious work studying and seeing and, and putting myself just looking at different training programs, different training methodologies. And I really enjoyed it. And I still do to some extent, I still do do that to some extent, but not quite so diligently. You know, I had every new client to me was a case study. Of, mm. This person has this background. I need to research all of it. Um, and that was super rewarding. You know, I have to say, it's like, if you're interested in people, there it is, you know, yeah. you've got people who need you. And, and not only that, but if you get it wrong, you might injure them. So there is that push of get it right. Um, yeah. And someone did get injured and I took it quite heavily. Um, someone who was working very hard and there was something that I hadn't spotted. Mm. Um, I mean, on the, on the general... Scheme of, in the general scheme of things, it was not like I was getting people injured left, right, and center. But that, this one person that got injured, I took it. It upset me. Um, but then uh, I was making sure I was trying to make sure that I had everything that I was avoiding injuries and niggles as much as possible. And my whole thing was I have been this person that could not move, and because some coaches took an interest in me i now can move and i can now teach you what not to do <laughs> what to do yeah. and what not to do and this this was you know when we talk about corporate well-being i was that broken person that well not broken damaged you know couldn't mm. get into a spot couldn't get into a run stand couldn't do a pull up so i was very passionate about helping the average um city person not mess it up like i did um so in that sense, I had, here's the thing, everyone has different, different things to bring to the table. I hadn't yeah. got the yeah. sports and exercise science degree or the athletic background or a sport, but I had that passion of, hey, I know how it can go wrong. So listen to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And someone pointed out, my head coach pointed out that, listen, some people really want someone to really look the part and that's not you. Um, but some people might find you more comforting because you look like you've had a different background. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, certainly for women, it can be quite an intimidating place to go into a, a gym and especially the weight section of a gym. Um, and so to have somebody who you can really relate to um, and who can say, you know what, I've been, I've been there um, is, is really great because I've worked with PTs who have just been They've been into fitness and exercise all their lives and they've always eaten healthily and you know i think i remember one who, who was an ex-marine or something like that and his response to somebody who was really struggling with with eating you know the right things which we know is, is an emotional thing was well just don't eat the cake I'm like mm. they know that mm. but it's not that it's not that simple there's if so much only, more to it yeah if only it were that simple right yeah like we all know what to eat and what not yeah to eat exactly so I think yeah someone who's been there and lived it is actually quite often more helpful I put this post up at some time this summer and I know you commented on it so you resonated with it of you know most overweight people they know what to eat and what not to eat that's not the problem the problem is that they're not emotionally they're expressing their desires through food mm. so if you can get them to express their desires in another way or get them to get be become fulfilled or come to a place of happiness in another yeah. way, then the weight will drop. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I know I have my own experience of when when I feel like I'm living on purpose and life is is kind of is feels meaningful and is going where I want it to go. 
like the emotion and emotional eating just disappears and I take really good care of myself and it's the you know it's when I feel like I'm not on purpose and what am I doing and where am I going and that's when that's an uncomfortable place to be and that's for me is when like I might not be taking as great care of myself I resonate with that yeah I completely get that yeah. so. <laughs> um so your retreats they're not just about like going and doing fitness and you know banging out a few squat reps they really are um about like you were saying like getting out of the basement like daylight like looking at living in a slightly different way if i've understood correctly yeah i I, to throw the my architectural background into the mix again um back in the day in, in when i was studying we were told i was specifically told my job was to solve the problems of the city and it's because i decided to take off into the countryside and do a project in the countryside and the head um the head of the course said to me that's cute but irrelevant and for what we are doing right here and i thought okay if i'm going to be in the city i need to solve the city problems and i realized that i didn't over time i realized man i am being hit by these city problems left right and center you know i was lonely i was not moving enough i was not in a job that was fulfilling i was like this this tiny little thing chucked by the waves and um over time i realized well i was lucky that a few people i had these fitness weekends every so often you know where um i was in different clubs and they would organize like a weekend in wales and a weekend here and a weekend there and i absolutely that was like the highlight of my of my month or of or my year Go, getting away and going with people to do, do something active and just feel human again and when it came to when i actually had the venue and it came to you know designing the ideal day um yeah it had fitness for sure and it had the fitness that i wanted to you know thoughtful fitness not just hey let's sweat uh, but hey let's learn from a coach that knows what they're doing how to move and how to do things properly but then there's also hey we're here together let's connect like let's find out because i i told you i had connection problems you know i didn't know how to make friends and yeah until i was in my 20s um hey like no let's we have this time together like let's get to know each other for real not just superficially and then forget um so i made people in the beginning i made people tell their story and uh which i nicked from another camp i thought there is everyone has this incredible story and if we don't get to that like what are we doing you know everyone has this incredible life experience and it's worth sharing and um sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't you know not everybody wants this sort of heavy yeah. environment where they are you know so i did it once and i realized okay that's amazing but it, it can you you can't really force it it has to mm. sort of come out organically um so there was that and interest in you know people actually bonding over something so giving people challenges for example is great because rock climbing is something that some people fear and it gets them really sort of on edge and then once you've done it it's like ah oh, and everybody knows each other a lot better because they've been yeah. through that struggle together yeah. it's a bit like you know why teams do tough mothers and because you have to support each other through the the work and then there's the nature bit which you know again in the city we don't get enough of and how travel works in this day and age is it's very commercialized and uh in an ideal world i want to get away from um taking people to places you know in a very commercial way of like we're all going to go on this i don't know tour so i'm trying to get away yeah. as far away from that concept as possible to just experience the wild um and in crete it's possible because you can go for a hike through a gorge or go explore a beach again it's you know the more i'm trying to get to that but there are places everywhere where you can do that you just have to take that stance of i'm here to help the environment not take away from it because this is what i found you know crete where i started is a very very people sell 
nature you know they sell a view or they will sell a beach or you know that's what people are, the environment is up for sale or for rent and what are we actually giving back to it you know i i love you know that people are doing beach cleanings and um fundraising for to get the plastic out of the ocean i love that so i want to be a part of that and i think there's a massive effort now for travel to be Mm. a transformational you know to for you to find your humanity through travel get back, back to your to feeling great through exploring and b to give something back to the planet rather than chucking plastic into it and petrol yeah, yeah. uh have i deviated from the question no the, the, no you've described you it's a much more holistic thing than just yeah like let's go and i think i've been on one fitness retreat where you know it was like first thing in the morning they put the like the insanity video on and we all had to just yeah. do the insanity workout and i was like no and i want to punch yeah. you in the face right now <laughs> because you know I, there is room there is it's just not a retreat it's a it's more of a boot camp yeah it's a boot boot camp yeah it's true yeah i think you know there is definitely room for all of that to happen like i i was talking to a lady who works in my building who just has just been on one of those and she loved it because Mm. she just wants to for now she wants to sweat really hard with other people and that is right yeah up her up up the street but um I think for me, again, and I struggle with that because I was told a few times that, hey, we just need a bit more chill time because I just want to pack the day. Hey, you can do this and this and this. Mm. But actually what people really want is to have, you know, a few hours in the afternoon when they actually just sit with their thoughts, maybe take the journal out and journal. So the more I run these things, the more I realize there is power in just having a breather. And so I that's the next thing and so now um we've started doing yin yoga with becky um where two or three minutes you sit in a pose and it's amazing how much can happen in those sessions where you i tend to i know this is not what you're meant to do but i mull over my day and I, I, but in a very calm way you know? yeah and this happened and this happened and wow you know and i have these thoughts um Everyone meditates differently, but I feel like you at least need to have the space to do it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you definitely. Um, I find if I do ever give my my time myself space, that's when the creativity flows. That's when the ideas come. That's when I can get excited about something. But when I'm go 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 go, there's just no space for it. Right. They and I think I don't know. Remember where I read it, but Darwin came up with his theory of evolution. You can take this with a pinch of salt, but he was basically on holiday in the Galapagos and he was walking around observing and he must have spent quite a bit of time there, but I don't think he was stressing about producing some sort of theory. I think he was just taking in the sights and observing. Mm. And that's when, like you say, that's when the creative thoughts come, when you're not just letting yourself be. I think it's a very 20th century or 18th century thing to be this machine of yeah production yeah it's all you know i mean the 40-hour work week is based on machine output it's yeah. nothing to do with how much humans can manage it's yeah like, it's crazy or what we are really like because what we are really like is not production machines mm. where yeah, yeah. Mm. so covid um <laughs> i know we, we talked about this a little bit earlier um obviously not so much travel happening during covid but you found a way to pivot and um mm. i found a gift i suppose in the whole covid experience oh, it was it was i hope i'm not being offensive to anyone but it was a very much needed kick in the butt and um, obviously i i my window faces in thomas's hospital so i'm i was mm. looking at it the whole time and i was praying and really it was hitting home every day, you know, those guys in there, there's a lot of suffering happening. But my uh, initial, obviously events stopped, so I couldn't really, we had an event planned for June, which we postponed to August. And again, we had no time to advertise it. We didn't really know if it was gonna go ahead. We went there, but with not really as planned. 
Um, but the main thing was because there was no physical connection and I did a lot of networking on Zoom, a lot of sort of getting out of my small bubble and meeting new people. Um, and I met some brilliant women who advised me on several business things. And one said to me, you need a board, like a, an advisory board. Like get, have a circle around you of people that you trust that can advise you on what you're doing because you're just one person. Mm -hmm. And so I built this network of people. Um, I mean, I met some brilliant women. Um, and one of them said to me, how about you go to Crete and you do, you take all the content and you do an online retreat to offer to people who can't travel because nobody can travel. So we did that, uh, which was a great idea. And then um, I did a startup boot camp with two other ladies. So like an eight week sort of tiny form of business school, which I've never done a business, you know, I've never mm. been to business school, but if you haven't been to business school and you want to start a business, what do you do? You know, if you've never had your own business. So I did that. Um, I did a lot of therapy. Um, I did some dancing in my room with like a one-on-one -on -one Zoom class. So it was a, a period of a little bit of healing and a little bit of business um, studying and a lot of thinking about, hey, what can I do? I did, I did some writing. Um, and eventually I realized I'm in London. Why am I trying to run a business abroad? Like it's just, and the answer is because it was easy to start there because I had the, the house and it was like, here, I've got this idea. Let's, let's put it into practice. But the reality is the harder thing for me to do and the more, more challenging was to start running them in the UK. And it, it, that's where I had this massive imposter syndrome of I wasn't born here. Like, what am I trying to do? I don't have, like, am I allowed <laughs> almost? Like, who am I to tell the Brits where to go in, in England? Um, and I was looking at, there, there's a couple of people that I was looking at that who, who run sort of outdoorsy things. And I thought, oh, you know, in my head, I was oh, I wish I was there. And yeah. then, um, because I'd, I'd been given this gift when I was younger of, of, you know, being able to go away, escape for the weekend or escape for a month in the summer. Mm. And I knew that this is adding value to people and even more importantly, adding value to city people. And I knew this was in the back of my head. And so lockdown happened, August happened, I learned a ton. And then we were going to do, again, Crete in October. And then we couldn't. And I'd promised, and people had booked, and I'd promised them. So I was like, you know what? We're going to relocate it to the UK. I've had enough of having to live in one place and having to do business in another. Like, who does that? And I don't want to be a travel operator, a tour operator. Yeah, tour operator. I'm yeah. Not, I'm not a, this is not what I'm doing. And so um, somehow, you know, all, all of my experience just sort of... Um, I sort of put it together and I thought, I know Weymouth. I contacted a friend who I'm about to see today, actually, who is a caterer and she introduced me to a, a brilliant chef. And then I got in touch with my team of coaches and said, hey, are you up for this? And they were like, yeah. Um, so again, you know, people who've paid money to go to Crete are not necessarily going to pay the same money to go to Weymouth or maybe don't, don't want to go to Weymouth or to them it was an experience somewhere really warm so it was a diff slightly different crowd but again we sold our places like we couldn't take you know rule of six can't take more than six mm, yeah um even then we pushed it slightly um sold six places went down to weymouth it was a pl it was a joy like for me yeah, could I have done it better? Absolutely. There's a lot of things that I'll do better next time. But it was such a joy to be like, I'm in, I'm in the country I'm in, I live in, and I'm doing business here, and I'm offering something that people like, and I see value in it, they see value in it, everyone's having a good time. Amazing. Like, tick. You know, one yeah. goal achieved. And then came back, and I told these two women that I ran the, um, that ran the boot camp. I was like, tick like i've done yeah. it it went well we're gonna run this more more often and they said let's get some champagne <laughs> <laughs> 
I kid you not, we had we did that yesterday, and I was like, right. I'm finally doing. I did the challenging thing, not the easy thing, and uh, it took a COVID to do this. Yeah. yeah, and was it? This is always something that I experienced. Was it as hard as your brain was telling you it was going to be? It was. I will tell you, it was so much easier than planning the overseas stuff. Yeah, so much easier and so much more. Um, I don't know, rewarding. Because mm. you're actually building something that you've got the foundations for. Yeah. It's just so, so frustrating, the stories that our brains tell, tell us that are just so not yeah. true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, one book that I read during lockdown that I recommend to anybody doing anything creative, it, you probably have read it, The War of Art. The Stephen Pressfield. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It was a long time ago I read it, but yeah, and I've, I've one of the quotes I think from that something along the lines of, the thing that you have most resistance to is the thing that is most important for you to do. Something along those lines. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh God. <laughs> that book is full of. He says the same thing in so many different ways that it's mm. bound to hit you at some point. Yeah. 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 Amazing. So. Um, don't, we've covered a lot of bases. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you could kind of, if you had one piece of advice for anybody who's thinking, you know, this isn't it, this isn't what I'm going to be doing with my life. Obviously, looking back on all of your experiences, how do you have any thoughts as to where, where to start? Like, what's the, the next step that someone can take when they're in that place? First of all, I highly recommend therapy because a lot of the times when we're in a place that doesn't suit us, it's because we haven't given us, ourselves permission to go where it does suit us and we don't have permission to express um, our full self. So how do we get that permission? I think by being listened to, you know, by finding a, an outlet to express yourself and feeling that those dreams are legitimate. Um, so whether if you can do it on by your by yourself, absolutely, you know, take the journal out, write them, write write down what you what where you'd rather be, and go out there and do it. But I found personally, I needed someone to speak to, to actually hear myself, and for that person to validate what I was thinking. And rather than you know, if they'd said, "Oh my God, what?" you know, I probably would have thought twice. But um, yeah, give yourself room for expression of your full self. Um, um, I'm thinking, you know, there's five books that are classics that I can send you that for me helped me throughout my the past 25 mm. years of self-help. <laughs> um, got five books that everybody should read. Most people ha probably have read, but you know, like we can still put them out there. Yeah. Um, and then, um, I want to say faith is a big thing, you know, you know, I don't know where, you know, I obviously went to church, but um, there are many ways of finding yeah. potential and the, the reason for you being here, you know, everybody yeah. has value and yeah. sometimes we lose sense of it by comparing ourselves to others yeah. or someone told us that success looks like this, therefore you have to be this. Yeah. Um, I think you're right. Faith is different. It's really fascinating. You you went started going to church at the time that I stopped. I I I'd been going going to church all of my life up until my late twenties, and then was like, this is not it. It doesn't fit. I feel like I'm being told I should do this. I shouldn't do this. You're going to go to hell. All of this kind of stuff. That was my experience of it. And it was when I left and I went and found my own spirituality. So a course in miracles and everything else that I've explored mm -hmm. since then, and that felt way better but it was still faith mm. and I personally I often I just think I don't know how you navigate all of this without mm. something a, a sense of something bigger yeah. and like you say a sense that it's not an accident that I'm here and that I am the person that I am so the more yeah. the closer I can get to being my authentic self then the better because yeah. that otherwise, why would I have been put here amidst all of these billions of other people exactly as I am, if it wasn't to live 
yeah. as authentically um as genuinely as I possibly could, can yeah I think I'd also say um <laughs> there's an I don't know if you read um Mark Manson he is the guy who wrote um yeah, of, yeah. 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 So he swears a lot on his blog <laughs> but I think he does it on purpose but yeah. it doesn't work for me but but he has this one blog where he says nobody waltzes into the next stage of life just for fun they are kicked out of the previous stage of life like school finishes university finishes mm. maybe a relationship finishes maybe you know in my case your father di- my father died um uh something something tragic or hurtful happens and then we are forced to grow um and so instead of looking at those things with oh my god you know here we go you know this unpleasant thing is going to happen mm. like covid you know let's embrace those things for not for because they're fun but because they are pushing us to the next ooh, to the next level yeah um, yeah so i would say don't be afraid of bad things happening to you or feeling lonely or feeling lost because that feeling of being lost or being um lost at sea is what is going to get all the gears in motion for you to grow out of the current discomfort mm-hmm. and that is going to be so productive so sometimes people are like oh i'm having a crisis yeah embrace it because how else are you going to move to the next thing yeah yeah because we can be comfortable yeah. but that doesn't lead to fruitful yeah it's that quote that you see on on social media quite often isn't it from the universe i had to make you uncomfortable or you wouldn't have moved um yeah yeah, yeah. it's true there's there's usually a gift it might you might not be able to see the gift immediately right in the moment that something happens but there is usually a gift in in everything that happens yeah, yeah. so yeah i'd say you know at each point ask yourself what am i learning mm. yeah yeah what is this what is this teaching me about myself <laughs> sometimes it's not very nice to look at you know i definitely have, no. you know especially with the repeating patterns where you're like oh god not this again no. um but yeah you can you can either face it and learn the lesson or then or you'll learn the lesson further down the line um, yeah <laughs> the same thing whether you Last like later. it or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh, amazing so if obviously those five books yeah if you can send those to me then i'll pop them in the show notes for everybody um and yeah where can people find you if they want to find out more about your retreats and about everything that you do where should they look yeah uh www.morelifeadventures.com <laughs> okay or instagram more life adventures or i have a personal instagram which is my first name dot my last name stella camba and uh, any of those if you drop me a line it's me behind those things usually um uh and i'd love to connect with anyone um not just retreats but um yeah daily life i'm in the city you know i've embraced it that my life will be in the city and so if i can offer any value of you know things i've read or people i've seen who helped me or things i did fitness um yeah at space training anything yeah well, yeah you're a walking example of that because the reason that we connected was because you reached out after seeing something that i'd created so yeah absolutely absolute yeah. gold that thing yeah. <laughs> sometimes i think i need to get back and look at it what did i write <laughs> i forget gold <laughs> Well, thank you so, so much for sharing all of your wisdom and your time with us. I really, really appreciate it. And um, I'm really, yeah, I hope this episode is super valuable. I know it will be super valuable for everybody. So thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. And I hope to see you soon. (laughs) Yeah, thank you. So thank you so much to Stella for joining us and sharing her wisdom with us. And I hope that you found value in that episode. I have no doubt that you will have done And if you want to get in touch with Stella, as she said, it's www.morelifeadventures.com and you can find her under the same name on Instagram as well as under stella.camber. And if you're interested in the five books that Stella recommended, she has shared them with me as well as sharing them in the show notes. So I'm just going to share them with you now. So her five recommendations are um, emotional agility by Susan David, 
The Gifts of Imperfection by Brené Brown, which I can second. I have also read that one. The Inner Fix by Persia Lawson and Joanne Bradford. Boundaries by Henry Cloud and John Townsend. And Motivation Manifesto by Brendan Burchard. So some really interesting recommendations there for you to go and have a look at if you are considering that it might be time for you to make a bit of a change or you need a bit of a kick in the pants um, as regards how you're living your life. And yeah, thanks once again, Stella. Thanks to you all for watching and listening. And I really, really look forward to connecting with you again in the future. I have more guests up my sleeve. Um, so I'm really excited to share their wisdom with you in the future. But for now, here's to a life lived fully on purpose. Bye for now.